Good afternoon. It's Monday, March 6th. I'm Yael Shear, and this is IBA News, broadcasting live from Jerusalem. Defense Minister Avigdor Lieberman told the Foreign Affairs and Defense Committee today that Israel received a strong direct message from the Trump administration to refrain from taking unilateral action, including imposing Israeli sovereignty on Judea and Samaria. Lieberman said the U.S. administration warned that such steps would lead to an immediate crisis. The defense minister called on members of the coalition to state the government's position on the matter clearly. He said that while Israel must separate from the Palestinians, they cannot be absorbed inside Israeli territory, warning that such a move would require Israel to absorb 2.7 million Palestinians and grant them Israeli residency. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu considers Iran to be the world's greatest generator of terrorism. Speaking today at a memorial event at the Foreign Ministry, marking 25 years after the Israeli embassy bombing in Buenos Aires, Netanyahu said Tehran is responsible for the vast majority of Israel's security concerns as it continues to develop its nuclear and ballistic missile programs. Netanyahu, also serves as the country's foreign minister, said Iran continues to destabilize the region, threatening Israel with annihilation. He stressed the Jewish state is committed to fighting terrorism, which is only one arm of Iranian aggression. Basal al-Araj, a 31-year-old suspected Palestinian terrorist, was killed in a shootout with an elite border police unit and IDF forces in Ramallah overnight. The incident occurred during a raid to arrest al-Araj, who opened fire at the troops as they surrounded the safe house where he was located. Searching the premises, security forces uncovered an M16 rifle and an improvised Carlo-styled submachine gun. Two other Palestinians suffered gunshot wounds to their lower limbs in clashes that erupted in the area. There were no Israeli casualties. Elsewhere in Judea and Samaria, security forces arrested 12 Palestinian terror suspects and handed them over to the Shin Bet Security Agency for questioning. In Bethlehem, troops confiscated thousands of shekels in cash, and according to intelligence information, the money was used to fund terrorist activities. The Supreme Allied Commander in Europe, U.S. Army General Curtis M. Scaparotti, arrived for an official visit in Israel today. It is his second visit to the Jewish state since taking office last year. At a meeting with Chief of Staff Lieutenant General Gadi Eisenkot, the two discussed regional developments in the area and common challenges in the Middle East. Scaparotti also toured a number of military bases and will later meet with the IDF echelon. The Army said his visit symbolizes the strong ties and sec security cooperation maintained by Israel and the U.S. military. In other developments, Prime Minister Netanyahu is slated to be questioned later today for the fourth time by police investigators as part of a series of corruption probes against him. Today's session is expected to focus on the so-called 1000 case involving expensive gifts and personal favors that the Netanyahu family received from prominent business people. There's also the possibility that the Prime Minister will be probed over his meetings with Yediot Ahronot newspaper publisher Arnon Moses. In recent weeks, investigators have had some difficulty coordinating time to question Netanyahu because he was away on a series of visits abroad. They were reportedly eager to squeeze in this round of questioning before he departs to Moscow later this week. Earlier today, Police Commissioner Roni Alshech said that the Prime Minister's investigation is in its final stages and that police will update the public when it is over. Agriculture Minister Yuri Ariel is pushing for the establishment of a new settlement to house the residents of the Court demolished Amona outpost. outpost. Ariel from the pro-settlement Jewish Home Party is requesting that the Benjamin Regional Council begin searching for a suitable spot. He also demanded that the Finance Ministry allocate 70 million shekels to the council within a week to allow initial planning to commence. Prime Minister Netanyahu initially promised that he would establish a new settlement in place of Amona, but appeared to backtrack on his promise following a meeting with American President Donald Trump in mid-February. The former residents of Amona began a hunger strike last week outside the Prime Minister's residence in Jerusalem. 
The recently approved settlement regulations law may serve to incriminate Israeli politicians, civilians and military personnel at the International Criminal Court in The Hague, 13 NGOs told the High Court of Justice. The warning was part of a 63-page petition submitted to the court by the organizations that include Peace Now and Yesh Din. The organizations asked for an immediate injunction that would prevent the law from being implemented, saying the Knesset acted outside its jurisdiction in passing the law, as it has no authority over the West Bank. The law, which was passed on February 6th, retroactively legalizes some 4,000 settler homes built on private Palestinian land and offers monetary compensation to the Palestinian landowners. The toppled headstones in the historic Washington Cemetery in Brooklyn, New York, were caused by neglect, not vandalism. This according to the New York Police Department, which announced after investigating the incident that the damage was attributed to bad weather and a lack of proper maintenance. Three other Jewish cemeteries have been vandalized in the past two weeks, and 100 bomb threats have been called in to Jewish community centers and institutions throughout the country since January of 2017. According to the FBI, eight of the bomb threats have now been attributed to a disgraced former journalist seeking to frame his ex-girlfriend. Reacting to the recent surge of anti-Semitic attacks in the U.S., visiting New York Governor Andrew Cuomo vowed to take action against any form of discrimination or hate crimes. Cuomo made the comments during a visit to the Yad Vashem Holocaust Museum yesterday afternoon and was accompanied by President Reuven Rivlin. The two laid a wreath and lit the eternal fire at a ceremony in the Hall of Remembrance. We must have zero tolerance for any abuse or discrimination of any fellow human being. In New York now and in the United States, we've had a rash of anti-Semitism, over 100 acts of anti-Semitism. And I'm sad to say also in my state, the state of New York. It is disgusting. It is reprehensible. It violates every tenant of the New York State tradition. These acts of anti-Semitism will not be tolerated. New York State has reacted aggressively with extraordinary measures, more aggressively than any other state in the nation, I am proud to say. We have posted rewards. We have put together a special unit of the state police. We've made it clear that there will be no tolerance for these acts of anti-Semitism. My sadness is that now another generation of young people has had to experience this pain, a pain that for many young people was only in the history books, is now very much in their daily lives. There is one lesson from the Holocaust. Never again. Jews must be safe wherever they are, wherever they are in the world, especially and specifically in the United States. Let us see none of this again. Israel has called for French officials to ban several events connected with the annual Israel Apartheid Week that starts today, asserting that it may actually violate local laws. Israel's ambassador, Aliza Binun, wrote to the mayors of several cities where events run by the boycott, divestment and sanctions movement are slated to be held, reminding them that the French laws concerning boycotts constitute a strong basis against the BDS movement. She also asserted that such activities reflect anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism. The BDS movement in France this year is marking what it calls 100 years of colonialism and popular resistance for justice, a reference to the 1917 Balfour Declaration affirming Great Britain's commitment to the establishment of a Jewish home in Palestine. Since 2005, Israel Apartheid Week is held in over 200 cities globally every year and features the placement of anti-Israel posters, boycott campaigns, and cultural events designed to highlight what organizers believe is the colonial character of the state of Israel. The ongoing work dispute at the Hadassah Ein Kera Medical Center continues. The team of doctors at the hospital's Children Oncology Department submitted their resignations after the department's head professor, Mickey Weintraub, stepped down due to a series of work-related disagreements with the hospital's CEO, Professor Zev Rothstein. The doctors asked permission to be transferred to the Sha'arei Tzedek Hospital in Jerusalem, but Health Minister Yaakov Litzman rejected the move. 
Hadassah's management pledged to do the best they could to ensure that no child will be harmed due to the resignations slated to go into effect in three months. The Labor Party announced July 3rd is the date it will hold its next primaries to choose the party's leader. Currently, a number of candidates are vying for the spot, including current party leader Isaac Herzog, former minister Avi Gabay, and MK's Omer Barlev and Eitan Kabel. All are required to register by May 1st. Failure by any of the candidates to secure a 40 percent vote will see a second round of elections held on July 13th between the two leading candidates. The party has not won an election in 18 years. The Ministerial Committee for Legislation voted in favor of supporting an amendment to an existing law that will allow new immigrants to receive Israeli passports soon after making Aliyah. The amendment to the passport law of 1952 received the uh, support of the entire committee yesterday and will now be submitted for three readings in the Knesset. Current regulations permit new immigrants to submit a request for an Israeli passport a year after their arrival in the country. During that period, the Interior Ministry issues them a temporary travel document. The participation of ultra-Orthodox males in the country's workforce plateaued in 2016. This despite significant recent rises in employment figures, according to data released from the Central Bureau of Statistics. Only 52 percent of ultra-Orthodox men were recorded as working in 2016, a 7 percent increase from 2011. But the number of men registered as learning full-time in kolels, yeshivas for married men, increased by 16 percent since 2014. According to the Israel Democracy Institute, this change can be attributed to increased government subsidies for kolel students, and as well as the restoration of certain state benefits. Despite the, the slow employment growth, the IDI stated that the poverty rate among the ultra-Orthodox dipped to 54 percent in 2015. The Voca people will be bringing their musical acrobatics back to Israel for a grand tour. The ensemble, created and directed by Lior Halfon and musically directed by Shai Fishman, has been performing throughout the world for the past three years. There will be 22 performances in Israel between March and April. The show is an artistic and musical celebration that explores the magnificence of the human voice without any accompanying instruments. In 2012, they won the Lucille Lortel Award for Outstanding Alternative Theatrical experience. Israel and South Korea are facing off at the World Baseball Classic. South Korea is hosting Israel at the opener of the 16-nation tournament in Seoul, South Korea, after Team Israel won its preliminaries in Brooklyn, New York in September. The majority of Team Israel players are American Jews, and the team will be making their first ever WBC appearance, sending big league veteran pitcher Jason Marquis, who has played with the Atlanta Braves, St. Louis Cardinals, and the Washington Nationals. Peter Kurtz, president of the Israel Association of Baseball, has said, quote, it's the first time in the history of Israeli sports that a group of Jewish American players have come forward and are playing for Team Israel, proudly representing our country and bringing us to a level that we can compete at world championships. The Israeli team brought its mascot, Mensch on a Bench, as well as a giant stuffed toy shaped like a Hasidic Jew. In finance, stocks were down on the Tel Aviv Stock Exchange and the shekel was mixed in foreign exchange trading. Here are the late afternoon numbers. Turning to the forecast, the IBA weather team says tonight will be partly cloudy with a chance of mist in central and southern coastal plains and strong easterly winds in the northern mountains. Tomorrow there will be a drop in temperatures in the coastal plain and the Negev. Here are the expected highs and lows at home and abroad for the next 24 hours.
that's our broadcast for today. Please join us again tomorrow when Laura Cornfield will be at this desk to bring you the latest news from Israel. Until then, I'm Yael Shear wishing you a good evening and shalom from Jerusalem.